So we decided to have this whole session on Ask the Experts. Uh, we actually got quite a few questions. So I'm pulling up a little bit of a uh, spreadsheet. I hope you guys can see. I think we had 18 questions. We broke them into, a lot of the questions covered the same ground. So we broke them into groups, basically stacking and focusing, mirrorless versus DSLR. Uh, we had some questions on email on Wacom, which is a, a, a tablet that you could use as an input device, a scanners, uh, a question about high key photography, quite a few questions about printing and a bunch of questions about Photoshop and Lightroom. So uh, we broke those out between our three experts here, or as Barney said, the knuckles heads. <laughs> but so Rachel, Barney and I are gonna attempt to answer all, all these questions. So. We're gonna get started with Rachel first and tackle the focusing and stacking questions. So, Rachel, you just tell me when you want to skip forward on this. Slide. Yeah, so hi everyone. My name's Rachel Dunlop and I shoot Canon and I've primarily been shooting DSLR until the late 2020 when I switched to mirrorless, but I trained in film many years ago. Um, next slide, please. So the questions that I'm gonna to address today are regarding uh, focusing and focus stacking. And there's three particular questions and they'll probably take about five to seven minutes to answer these. So the first question is, which is a better way to ensure landscape photos with very sharp depth of field um, using F16 or photo stacking? And what are the problems with both of these approaches? So this person's mentioned F16 and normally if you have a, a, a small aperture, which is a large F number, uh, that's normally um, enough to increase sharpness on a landscape photo. But I'm gonna paraphrase every answer today by saying it totally depends on what you're shooting. So there are limits to the way that optics work on lenses as well. Um, generally the extreme end of lenses is not gonna be as sharp as somewhere in the middle and each lens will have a sweet spot. Picking F16 is generally a good start if you wanna get a wide range of focus in a scene of landscape. So from you know, um, close to the camera to the mountains in the background. So if you're standing on 89 and you're shooting over Schwabackers to the mountains, you probably will get something that's pretty much in focus. However, that's not always the case because it depends on the focal length that you're using, and it depends on the lens you have. In addition, light will not bend. It light gets bent depending on how small your aperture is. So if you've got F16, as you would know, that means your aperture is very small. And if you're shooting at F2.8, your aperture is very wide and light has to bend in around to get into your lens and onto your sensor. So, Generally, a rule, a good rule of thumb is if you want to shoot a landscape image and you want everything in focus, choose somewhere between a third and a halfway into your scene, select something like F16, shoot the scene and look on the back of your camera. And the best way to do that if you're shooting with digital, which I presume most people are, zoom in really close. So use your little, um, you know, um, uh, focus like you're zooming in on the back of your LCD screen, your magnifying glass, and look at those pixels and see if it's sharp. If you're happy with that result, then that's fine. You just shoot at f16. If you're not happy with that, you can do something called focus stacking. So, David, can you go to the next slide, please? So here's an example of a landscape photo that I shot at F16. You can see up in the corner, here's the EXIF data. So this was shot at 27 millimeters F16. It's quite a slow um, shutter speed because I wanted to get the water fairly blurry. And I focused on the rock here at the front of the scene. As you can see, the rock is really sharp. The rest of the scene is not very sharp. And I'm not worried about the fact that it's not very sharp because my focus, my subject here is the rock. As you move further back into the scene, the trees and the bushes and the rocks at the back aren't as sharp, but I'm fine with that because the whole image is really about showing this flowing water with this sharp rock at the beginning. So I'm very happy with using F16 to shoot that particular image. Can you go to the next slide, please? 
Now here's a way that you can, if you wanted to shoot a landscape um, scene by using focus stacking and a really good application for focus stacking is something like you see here. So here you can see, I've got these bushes in the front here, which I think are willows. These are really sharply in focus. And then all the way through this scene, you can see that I've got sharp focus. So the, the willows at the front are sharp, the reflections are really sharp and the mountains are super, super sharp. This is a focus stacked image of approximately four images. Now the question that was asked here was, what are the downsides of either of these two techniques? Well, if you're gonna focus stack, you're going to need a tripod, obviously, because the way that you will do it is you have to focus at different focal points through your scene, but you're taking the same shot. So you're taking three or four shots or as many as you want actually through the scene by focusing first at the start. So on the bushes here, the willows. Secondly, on the reflections in the pond, thirdly, possibly in the trees at the back of the pond and fourthly, possibly the mountains. So you're gonna get everything sharp, but as you do that, other things aren't gonna be in focus. So next slide, please. So it's a very simple way to do focus stacking by combining the images. So once you've taken the images, so you're gonna need a tripod. So that's one downside. If you are sort of just out in the field and you've got your camera handheld is not really gonna to work to do this because one of the issues with focus stacking is that you don't want things to move in the scene. So for example, if it's a very windy day, the clouds are moving really quickly, the shadows are moving. If for example, those willows at the front of that shot that I showed you before are moving, if you're gonna try to combine four images, that's gonna be difficult for you because things would have moved and you'll end up with blurry stuff anyway. So part of this question was, well, is there software that you can use to focus stack without having to buy extra new software? Now, David, I think is gonna talk a little bit about the software that you get. So if, if you subscribe to Adobe and you get Lightroom, that's a photographic bundle. And you also get in that bundle access to Photoshop. And you also get access to Adobe Camera Raw and Adobe Bridge. So if you have access to Photoshop, it's very, very easy to focus stack in Photoshop. And I'm gonna do a quick demo of that in a minute. You can also focus stack in your camera if you have an advanced camera. Now I've never done it. I think Barney does it. Um, there are ways that you can actually tell your camera to basically do the same as what I've just described, where when I shoot a focus stacked image, I manually focus on the bushes at the front, move my focus to the, to the pond, move my focus to the trees, move my focus to the mountains. You can tell your camera to do that. And it depends on the kind of camera you have, but there, that is an option. And it means you don't have to buy software. There are other softwares that are very good and they're dedicated to do just focus stacking. One is called Helicon Focus. There's one called Zarine Stacker and one called On One Photo Raw. And I've used Helicon Focus, it's excellent. If Photoshop doesn't work for you, it usually does. Of course, you can get 30 day free trials with these software. So you still have to pay in the end, but initially they're free. Switch to the next slide, please. So I wanna show you an example very quickly of how to do this in Photoshop because it's very, very simple. And I did have an image. Um, if you can skip to the next image, David, or did I not put it? I don't think, I actually go back, sorry. So because of the nature of Zoom, and I, I could show you how I put together that landscape image that I just showed you, but um, for the sake of demonstration and to um, give you a really good example of how this is how this works, I'm going to use something that is not landscape, even though someone asked about it. Because if I try to show you the difference in focus between a landscape image in this environment, it probably won't be clear to you. So what I've done is I've just set up some objects on my kitchen table, and I'm going to show you the difference between shooting at f16 and shooting the same scene but focus stacking it. So here, David, can you switch? Can I share my screen now? Okay, it's all yours. Okay. So here is a image that I took at F16. And what I want you to notice 
is that as can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yep. Okay. So what I want you to notice is that you can very easily read the writing here on this candle. The focal point is here. The vermouth is slightly, slightly blurry. Um, that's what happens when you drink it, I'm, I'm told as well. <laughs> But what I particularly want you to focus on is here. This is um, a tag in this plant that you cannot read when I've shot this at F16, which indicates that the focus has fallen away towards the back of the picture. So what I then did is I went into, I shot it, at, I, I took three images and I focused at different planes through that image. And now I'm gonna show you how to combine them. So the first one here, is focused on the candle again. It's very easy to, let me just zoom in on that, hang on. Can everyone see how, how sharp that is? Yep. Um, and then let me just go back to close that one. This one here, you can see now the candle is blurry but you can read the vermouth very well. And then the third image that I took, if that's Photoshop, is this one. And now you can see that you can actually read, whoops. Just go to 100%, not 12,000 would be helpful. <laughs> So now you can read that this is a snake plant. Can, you, can everyone see that? Yeah. Okay, so there's a focus point all the way through this image now. So I'm gonna show you how to combine those three images, which were again, shot on a tripod, that's really important. And so I'm using here, I'm using um, Adobe Bridge, but the same principle applies in Lightroom. It's three steps, literally three steps to make a focus stack if you have access to Photoshop. So you select your images. Now in Lightroom, you would go to edit in and open as layers in Photoshop. In Bridge, you just go tools, Photoshop, load files into Photoshop layers. And then it takes me to Photoshop layers. And what it's gonna do is just bring in these individual images as different layers, as you can see over here. So now if I turn them off, you can see here I've got the sharp candle, here I've got the sharp vermouth, and here I've got the sharp snake plant. Okay, they've all come in to Photoshop. Now all you do it's literally so easy. You go select all your layers, select them together. You go edit. The first thing you do is align them because there's potential that maybe there was a breeze, maybe you knocked the tripod, maybe they're not exactly aligned. Align the layers first. And so Photoshop will say, how do you want me to do it? Just do auto, it's very simple. It thinks about it, it aligns them for you to make sure they're all lined up. Then you simply go edit, auto blend layers, it asks you, how do you want to blend them? Do you want a panorama or you want to stack? Go, I want to stack them. Stack. And it does it. And so now you can see we've got sharp candle. We can read this snake plant and we've got sharp vermouth. So we went from not having focus in the background, not being able to read that this is a snake plant to being able to read it. And it's very, very easy. It's just those three steps. You'd simply select the three images or the four images or however many you've taken, go open as layers in Photoshop, select those layers, say align the layers and then blend the layers. That's it, it's so simple. And then you have a photo stacked image. Can you go back to, I'll just stop sharing now, David. You can go back to, my, to the um, PowerPoint, please. So that's one way you can do it using Photoshop. Um, the, those other three types of software that I mentioned are a different kettle of fish. And I'm not gonna go into those because the person asked the question, specifically asked about 
without paying for extra software. And most people do have access to Photoshop if they've subscribed to the photo bundle. Next slide, please, David. The next part of the question, um, so just to summarize really is, someone also asked regarding focusing, is there a process one should go through to assure foreground and background are in focus? Well, I've sort of covered this, but I'm just gonna reiterate that just take a photo. If you have a scene in front of you, focus a third or a half into the image, shoot at a closed down aperture like F13, F16, look at the back of your camera if you're happy with the shot. So I showed you that picture I took of the, of the um, creek where I was, I was happy with that at F16 because I don't need the trees right at the back to be focused. If you're not happy, you can focus stack. You need to take more than one image. You focus through the plane of the image. So you start at the very beginning and then you go to the back. And this is particularly applicable for things like if you have a foreground interest. So maybe you've got like a big rock at the, at the front of your image or perhaps a big log or something and then a, and a lake and then the mountains and you want everything in focus. Then you'd focus on your rock first. You'd focus on something in the lake, whether there's like a, a pine tree on the side of the lake, then you'd focus on your mountains. You've got three images and then you need a tripod definitely to do that. And then you simply combine them as I just showed you in a focus stacking program and Photoshop can do that for you in very, very easy steps. Next slide, please. I put this slide in here because this is a really um, good tip that I picked up from another photographer. And I just mentioned that if you're gonna focus stack, you'll need to take more than one photo. And frequently, if you're in the field doing that, you're often moving slightly your composition. Maybe you take one from standing up with your tripods high and maybe then you get down really low, or maybe you even just shift the frame slightly to the right or the left. When you get back to your computer, you're gonna end up with a whole bunch of photos and you're not sure where they start and where they end. So if you've taken three photos of this particular scene, which is um, on Jackson Lake, but then the next set you've taken slightly differently, how do you tell <coughs> where they start and where they end? So this is a really nice way to mark your sequence when you're shooting a focus stacked image. So all I do is at the beginning of my sequence, so say I'm about to shoot that rock in the foreground there, I put my hand in front of the lens first, I take a photo so I know, okay, here's where my sequence starts. So then the first photo I know is gonna be the rock in focus. The second one's gonna be those midway rocks and the third one's gonna be the mountain. And then once I've got those series of images, I put my hand back again. So I know that's the end of my sequence. Really helpful for when you get back to your computer and you don't know what's up or down because you've taken so many shots. Um, next, next slide, please. So that's all I have on focus stacking and focusing. Obviously there's a lot more to discuss, but um, in the time <laughs> I've covered those questions, I think. Um, the second question I was asked to address was, what do you believe are the key differences between digital and mirrorless cameras? If you moved from digital to mirrorless, why did you decide to change? What were the key ingredients that lured you to <laughs> buy mirrorless and what was the cost to make that change? So I'm glad I got this question because I was a slow, adopter with regard to mirrorless. I know some people in this club have been using mirrorlesses for eight to 10 years. I only swapped in 2020. Um, David and I both waited for the Canon R5. And um, prior to that, I was shooting a Canon DSLR. And I would have to say that as someone who shoots a lot of wildlife, a mirrorless camera is an absolute game changer for me. Absolute game changer. Um, in particular, the, the fact that there's now an electronic shutter giving me access to 20 frames per second makes my life so much easier. And when I say that, I mean that if I'm sitting in the field for three or four hours waiting for um, a moose to stand up or a coyote to jump or an eagle to take off out of a branch and I miss that shot because my camera only shoots seven frames per second, then my life is so much harder. So when I shoot, when I was shooting with my DSLR, although it's a wonderful camera and I still use it a lot, I would miss a third of a sequence of a coyote jumping because I could only get seven frames per second. Now I can get 20, I can get all those frames in, and then I can, then I don't, I haven't wasted my time. One note of warning with that though, is if you're having, if you're taking 20 frames per second, 
you've got to edit 20 frames per second. Yeah. And you'll notice that with the electronic shutters on most um, mirrorless cameras now, they're silent as well. So you can just hold down that shutter if you're on rapid shooting and you'll shoot, you know, before you know it, 200 shots. And then you get home and they're all the same, pretty much. I mean, I, I have a friend who once, he bought a brand new mirrorless and he went out and shot fireworks and did that and ended up with like thousands of shots of fireworks that all looks the same. So you wanna be careful, but I would absolutely say that that is a game changer for wildlife. Um, the electronic viewfinder for me is a game changer as well. So with my DSLR, when I look through the viewfinder, I can just see, I can see the speed, my f-stop, um, where my exposure is, but I do not have access to a level and I do not see a histogram. Now, this means that I'm basically guessing if my images are exposed correctly are based on what my camera is telling me, which is not always accurate. So frequently with my DSLR, I will shoot bracketed. So I'll shoot where it tells me is perfect exposure and I'll shoot one stop lower and one stop higher. When it comes to mirrorless, I have a histogram right there in my face. So I can, I can push where I want the exposure to be up or down, depending on what I'm shooting. And I have a level right there. Now DSLRs have those two things, but only in live view. And I don't use live view when I'm shooting in the daytime. I sometimes use it at night when I'm shooting Astro, but having those two things in my electronic viewfinder is absolutely critical now. And when I shoot with my DSLR now, which I still do, I frequently go, where's my histogram? Oh, it's not here, I don't have one. Um, the other thing I would say about mirrorless is the, the focusing, the new focusing technology, particularly the eye tracking technology, which most of the mirrorlesses have. So this is particularly relevant too for people that shoot wildlife. Um, the focusing will pick up the eye of the animal and track it for you. Um, one thing to note about this in this environment here it doesn't work in snow and it doesn't work in rain either. And it doesn't work in sagebrush very well either, by the way. So it's easy to confuse it, but if you have the right environment, it's very, very good and it's very, very fast. Um, so that's one thing that also is a game changer. I will just add to um, the myths about mirrorless, which I believed before I got a mirrorless rig, I thought I would be getting something smaller and lighter. And that's not necessarily true. It can be true. I was shooting a full frame DSLR with zoom lenses because I shoot a lot of wildlife. When I um, changed to mirrorless, I bought another full frame camera mirrorless and a one to 500 mil native lens. And it's just as heavy and just as big as my previous rig. Of course, if you want to change to something like a micro two thirds or you know, a crop sensor, you can get something very compact and very light. But you won't necessarily get that. And David Navratil um, talks about how he, before he purchased his Canon R5 mirrorless, he actually put together a spreadsheet in Excel comparing the weights of DSLRs to try and find something lighter. And I don't think David had a lot of success in finding something lighter. So it depends what you wanna shoot. In defense of DSLR, I will say that I still use my DSLR frequently to shoot landscape. And I frequently go out on a kayak and I take that with me because if I sink, I'd rather lose that than the mirrorless. <laughs> the person here asked how much I spent. I spent $7,000 to get a body and a one to 500 millimeter lens. That's a lot of money. Um, if I didn't shoot anything apart from landscape, I probably would not go mirrorless because my DSLR is perfectly functional. It's a really good camera to shoot landscape. I love it. I still use it for that. Um, so yeah, I would just say overall, if you can make your life easier and you're more likely to capture things in front of your face with technology, upgrade your technology. There's no reason to make your life harder. You know, I've actually had an experience late last year where I was in Yellowstone, I was in Lamar. I was focused on um, a badger and a coyote. They were just sort of sitting there quietly and all of a sudden they started to have this fight and they ran across the field and all I had to do was hold down that shutter and I got the whole sequence. And my partner who was standing next to me was like, what just happened and didn't get any of it. So don't make your life harder. If you think that a mirrorless is gonna be able to capture stuff that you can't get with your other camera, I would not hesitate to upgrade. Um, and that's all I have to say, thanks. Can I add something? Of course. 
Um, I made the change from a digital to mirrorless. And for me, which is almost all of my photographs are with landscape, um, the mirrorless being, being able to see through the uh, exposure exactly what it would look like when you took the picture it makes all the difference in the world in certain situations. Like this morning, I took pictures, there on, some of them are on uh, Facebook of um, sunrise. Well, half of the picture is really bright and half of the picture is black. And now I can adjust the exposure to see what do I wanna see. It just is, I don't have to make any guesses at that anymore. It, it's become very, uh, something that I can't do without. I do take some pictures of the DSLR, but most of my pictures now are mirrorless because with landscape photography, it's all also about a third of the weight of the camera and the, and the lens. No yep. 500 millimeter lenses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I would add something also. Uh, you probably do lose, uh, you, you use more batteries. Uh, Oh, yeah. Although I haven't found it a real issue yet. Um, I used to always carry a battery with me and never need it. Now I carry a battery with me and wind up putting it in. But I, I think there'll be a few situations where mirrorless use a lot more battery, but I think- In the, the winter, I would, I, I would expect that's gonna happen. Well, and also if you're waiting on something to move like a bird, and you have to, you just sit and sit and sit and keep turning it on, a camera with a mirror is basically taking almost no power at that point where running the viewfinder is. But that again, I haven't found it an issue yet. I, I was very concerned about that. And uh, I agree with Rachel, the, the autofocus and the see what you're getting, uh, it makes all the difference. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm now contemplating selling all of my mirrored cameras. <laughs> so, uh, uh, may, may I ask a question? Sure. So for for all three of you, David and Rachel and Randy and anybody else who wants to chime in that has a mirrorless, for me, weight is always an issue because of wrist problems. Um, and I've read quite a bit that the weight difference isn't that great. But if I'm hearing you correctly, um, there is a difference. Okay, I'm gonna, since I'm the guy that put the spreadsheet together, <laughs> <laughs> um, the biggest thing that dictates the weight are the lenses. And if you're gonna shoot a full frame camera, there's gonna be very little difference in weight. I mean, uh, if, if you're shooting a fairly, I mean, maybe a wide angle and a mirrorless, and, and that's all you shoot, but if you're shooting a APC camera, then correspondingly, the lenses get smaller. If you're shooting a micro four thirds, the lenses get even smaller. And I would, I, I, I'll be happy to share the spreadsheet, but most of the weight is in the lenses, not in the camera, except if you're shooting, uh, you know, like a pancake lens and, or a, a small wide angle, then yeah, they're significantly lighter. But when you look at the percentage, if you start adding on a, a telephoto lens or big wide angle, fast wide angle lenses, all of a sudden the percentage is not nearly as big as, as you think. So, okay, thank you. Yeah, if and that makes sense. It does in a sense depend on what you're comparing. If you compare, and I can only speak for Nikon, if you get a Nikon 850, and then compare it to a Nikon Z7, I would imagine it's almost half the weight. But that's just the body. Yeah. Go throw a 600 millimeter are lens. Also, I, yeah, I mean, if you go throw a 600 millimeter lens on that, you're talking about now a few ounces. So that's what I'm saying. It, it really, I think the lenses are the thing you have to look at to determine if it's worth it. it I mean, they're definitely lighter on the bodies. That's There's no doubt about that, but it's the whole package you're having to carry, not just one body. So uh, you got to look at everything you're doing. So, and quite frankly, mirrored lenses haven't gotten any lighter than the uh, <clears throat> DSLR lenses. So. so are the lenses from the DSLR 
compatible with the mirrorless or not in the same manufacturer? Yes, they are. Um, yeah. I, I still shoot mostly my DSLR lenses on my new Canon mirrorless with an adapter. You have to pay for an adapter. You still have to have um, an adapter. Okay. Correct. And I, mine cost about $200, but I, you know, I have thousands of dollars of glass. So the only native lens I own is a one to 500. Everything else that I use is the old fashioned DSLR lenses with an adapter and it's perfectly functional. Thank you. Yeah. Rachel, this is Barney. One, one follow-up question to that. Have you compared um, an image at the same focal length with your one to 500 versus one of uh, your standard DLS, DSLR uh, um, uh, lenses? Um, on on your mirrorless. No, I you understand haven't. what I mean. Okay, I haven't. No, I'm just I'm just wondering whether there's a, whether there's any, any discernible difference in sharpness. Um, I, I would say there would be because I was working with a Sigma 150 to 600. Sorry, Tamron 150 to 600, and it was starting to get pretty soft. To, um, I have not done that experiment. No. Okay, thanks. You might find the, the comparison on Photography Life, the um, that website, they do all that kind of stuff. Uh, I, I would say, um, uh, I mean, kind of to your question, I mean, like, uh, Rachel has a very, uh, a fairly significant resolution distance di uh, difference between her DSLR and her mirrorless. But the other, one of the things about a mirrorless camera is because you are focusing off the sensor, not off a separate focusing unit. Mm -hmm. They tend to be more accurate as, uh, and you don't have this problem of having to adjust a lens to match your camera. Oh. Uh, yeah, you don't are, have to calibrate your lenses. You yeah, yeah, you don't have to calibrate lenses by definition. If that lens is within manufacturer spec, it's going to be uh, focused accurately, uh, more so than a DSLR. So I don't know if anybody's ever had focusing issues with their DSLRs, but. Uh, uh, David, just, just one additional comment about that is when you're focusing in live view, you are uh, you're bypassing that uh, you're, you're you're focusing directly, like you are with with uh, with a mirrorless. Yep, absolutely. So yeah, so if you're yeah, so for action stuff where you're not bypassing the mirror, uh, the mirrorless cameras have a little bit of an inherent advantage there. Uh, and there are some other things they've had to overcome, which they've basically done through technology now. So. Uh, all right, uh, any other questions for that set of questions? All right, let's move on. Oops. Oh. All right, so I'm gonna take the next group of questions. One of the first ones we had was actually about when they, somebody emails, images. And this is actually a Mac only question. Uh, this doesn't happen if you're using a Microsoft based uh, operating system. So but it was, when I attach multiple photos to one email, they all end up right next to each other, their edges touch, it's difficult to appreciate the photos. So again, this is Apple's email system doing this to you. I, I have to agree, it's a little bit of a frustration. But if you look at my example over here, I hope y'all can see my mouse. In, an, uh, in Mac Mail, if you upload two images, it puts them right together like this. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, it's a little touchy to put your cursor in between and hit return, which is the answer. And it will make it look like the image on the right here. So you can try and do that. It, it's probably a little easier to pre-position your cursor in your uh, Apple email and then attach one image as a time at a time, which is, you know, again, it'll look, wind up looking like this and then you could easily put annotations in between. But if you just go and grab 10 images and put them in Apple email, they're gonna stick them all together 
and it really does it, for all the good things apple does it's kind of a weird system in the way they do that so hopefully that answered that question uh yes. then we had one on how do you travel with your oh, excuse me somebody asked a question no, I just wanted to thank you for, for answering that question, David. Thank <laughs> oh, you. Oh, you're, you're welcome. Um, yeah. How do you travel with your camera equipment when working out of a car and traveling by plane? So I, I, uh, I have everything kind of, I, to me, this is two scenarios. I have a big bag, which I have in the pictures here. Uh, there's a lot of different kind of bags whatever works for you. I have a low pro. I bought it uh, because I could stick two bodies in it. I carry a 100 to 400, uh, a 15 to 35, a 24 to 105, an extender, polarizers, a headlamp, cables, batteries, and a charger. And I can strap a tripod right back here on this part of it if I need to. Um, I also use a Black Rapid strap which you can see over here on the far right with a quick release. I have an ARCA plate on both of my cameras. And if I'm in a car, I usually have this in the seat beside me and open. Um, if I'm with somebody, I put it in the seat behind me. <laughs> um, and this is kind of just typically, I, I have almost everything I need in there. This little thing I have attached on the back is where I keep my filters. Um, this bag in particular I like because you can open the top and take a camera out from the top or you can unzip the whole back and take cameras out or it's got a side zipper and I can pull a camera out from the side which I almost never use but uh, that's kind of the big bag scenario and if I'm really going somewhere for quite a while I would take this with me and I, I never check camera gear on an air, airline anymore <laughs> so i there was well i don't know if i've ever done that actually uh, so yeah this bag kind of has everything i need in it um, the second scenario is a lot of times i go somewhere and now i'm going to take a hike or maybe i'm going on a plane and i don't want to carry too much stuff I have a small shoulder bag that's uh, actually mine shift and I can fit my 100 to 400 in and another and one other uh, lens, which is either, a, I'll either take the 24, 105 or the 15, 35 and I can throw an extra battery, a charger, a couple of necessary cables. I can fit my Black Rapid strap in there and I can even strap a small tripod on it if I want. So. That, that thing is pretty small. I can take it with me on a, on a plane ride. Uh, and then my computer and everything else goes in another backpack that way. So I don't know if you, and. Uh, so what do you do with your tripod in this situation? Uh, well, like I said, I can, a small tripod, I can strap on this small shoulder bag. Okay. And take it with me. And it, uh, I, you probably can't tell from the picture, but it's it goes over one shoulder. So like if I'm cross country skiing, I can have it on and then you pull it around to the front of you and it opens from the top. And it keeps everything out of the weather. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty waterproof. It's got nice zippers on it and stuff. So if I'm just going for a hike or a ski, this is what I take, or sometimes I just take, and I take this on the airplane because it's small and uh, uh, and a lot less weight than the other bag. <laughs> so if I'm going to be Dave, gone, yeah, go ahead. Would you describe the rapid strap? I'm not familiar uh, with. Okay, uh, if if you look at this over uh, on this photo, it's far right. I mean, it just goes over my left shoulder and hangs down, but the key part. Uh, if you can see is that little quick release. So uh, everybody can, I mean, every, there's a lot of manufacturers that make a thing called an Arca Swiss plate. Some years ago, a company named Arca Swiss standardized, instead of screwing things, uh, screwing your tripod, uh, 
into your camera directly. They built these little plates that everybody has accepted as a standard called the Arca Swiss standard. Yes, uh, that's what I have is the, the Arca okay. Swiss. So if you have the that plate on the bottom with this strap, now uh, I'll separate two things. The strap comes with a standard uh, screw in connector. You can screw on the bottom of your camera and just carry it that way. I've actually added a, a little quick release clamp from I think it's a company called Acrotech, which I really like this product. It's it's pricey, but it allows me to, you know, I can clamp my camera on a tripod, but when I get ready to start walking, I pop it off and I clamp it onto this uh, on the bottom of my black rapid strap. And now I got the camera beside me and I can carry the tripod separately or I can stick it back on a pack, but the camera's always ready. Uh, you mean the camera's kind of dangling at your, oh, yeah. at your side? Yeah, absolutely. And you gotta have okay. to keep a hand on it, but you can adjust mm -hmm. how high or low you want it. And, uh, and it's always there. Uh, uh, I also take, I have this around me when I'm on my kayak. So the cameras, <laughs> I don't drop it, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. And the, the one caveat I would give on the Acrotech clamp is it does have a fine adjustment. You wanna make sure that when you clamp it on, nothing's moving because as you, there's small variations between all the uh, Swiss plates. And if you move from one body to another or like on my 100 to 400 has its own uh, plate on the, on the foot on the, the uh, telephoto lens, you wanna make sure that's not, as when you first clamp it on, make sure the fine adjustment's nice and tight so that it doesn't slip while you're walking. And that's one of those, don't ask me how I know, so. David, can I ask, can I add, add a little bit to that? Sure, absolutely. Please. So um, for, for those of us that uh, carry a fair amount of gear and, and travel, uh, end up being on an airplane a fair amount, um, um, a rolling bag is, is an absolute necessity. And if, you're, if you need to go down that path, then look at Think Tank, uh, uh, look at what Think Tank has to offer. Um, it's, they, they, are, they are not cheap. I mean, you're gonna be spending $250, $300 for, for a rolling bag. Um, I've had mine for uh, almost 10 years now and it's as good as the day I bought it. And, and it goes everywhere. It's traveled all over the world. And I can't tell you how many times back and forth between North Carolina and here. Never gets checked, um, but it also has some built-in locks and cables so that if you are in a place like Africa, um, you can, and you, you uh, end up uh, dozing off a little bit, you can always secure it to your, to your, uh, to your chair leg. Um, the other the other bag, which I found to be very useful, uh, is one that Moose Patterson um, sold, and I think is now back up on the market. And th this is a this is a camera bag that doesn't have a tremendous amount of protection. It's a backpack bag, but it fits in any overhead uh, airline bin. So you think about the real small, narrow airline bins that uh, are in uh, some of these regional jets. Uh, this bag fits in there and you can carry a 500 millimeter, a couple of bodies and, and lenses, you know, as much weight as you want. Um, I got that on a, uh, when we were going over to Australia in 2006, um, I, I use it, it's my go-to bag. Um, and um, um, it has, it has held up. Um, I haven't, I haven't had to do any repairs or anything like that with it. It's, it's just a great bag. So those are two additional things to think about, uh, as far as sources go, uh, for the traveling photographer. Yeah, I would agree that there's a, I think all of these things are very personal and have to fit what your needs are, but there's a lot of great bags out there. I mean, it could be actually mind-boggling to look at them if you go in a big camera store <laughs> but uh, uh you know every i think everything has to fit what your needs are and what you're willing to deal with and uh, uh but yeah i i try to make it where everything i need will fit in that big bag and then smaller excursions it'll fit in the small bag and 
I think, uh, like Barty said, if I was doing a lot of airport airline traveling, I would probably invest in a uh, something that rolls. So, all right. Um, I had a question on what are the best ways to clean dust spots on your camera system? Uh, si God, excuse me, sensor. Uh, is there a difference between mirrorless and SLR? If I try to blow the spots away, they sometimes continue to stay on the sensor. I don't know. I solve this. So yeah, one way to solve it is send it out to a service, either the manufacturer or an authorized repair service. That means you're going to be missing your camera for quite a while. Uh, I, I do remember that sometimes there are camera shows and people like Nikon and Canon show up and offer to clean your camera for free. Uh, but I've actually used a do-it-yourself sensor cleaning kit. You can see it in the picture here. Uh, it's really simple. I mean, you blow everything out with the big blower over on the right, which is not part of the kit. Um, and then you use these little blue sticks. Oh, uh, let me, oops, excuse me. Uh, one thing you have to do, so uh, I'm going to go back just a bit. It said, is there a difference between mirrorless and mirror? No, you have to lock up the mirror on a mirrored camera, or you have to lock the shutter open on a, a mirrorless camera. So th they all have a menu option to make that happen. And you put a little dab of the fluid on the little blue stick and rub it across the sensor. Uh, all the sensors actually have a protective uh, glass plate in front of them. So you're not gonna hurt the sensor. The question is, are you gonna get it clean this way? They also give you this other little device here, This what looks like a pencil. If there's a stubborn, uh, something that really got stuck on the front, in front of your sensor, you can clean it off with that. Uh, there's some more advanced ones that I think actually give you a, a loop to look at your sensor, but I haven't found that necessary so far. Uh, so any questions on that? I've got something to add. When you get a kit like this, you want to get that blue piece that goes across. And so you only have to do one slide across the sensor. That one is a small one. If it's a, a, a larger scale on the, on, the, on the sensor, you'd have to go across twice each direction. So be careful when you order it, that it fits your sensor. Huh. I didn't know they made actually different sizes. Yeah, they do. Because I bought the one that's the smaller one and then realized when I went back, I thought, oh, I thought I was getting the right one. And then I, it, they, there's a different size. There's two different sizes. I suppose more than that for, for the smaller sensors. I would have to say in the last five years, I've used this maybe three times. So, But it's good to have in case you're in an environment where something happens, so. Um. And, and David, I, I would add that if somebody has a stubborn spot on their sensor, they should just reach out to the membership for, I mean, some of us have uh, some special cleaning agents that, um, uh, that are used to remove really stubborn uh, um, spots. Um, and uh, um, it, it's a very rare occurrence that you have to, do, have to, have to use something like that, but it, it, it saves you. 70 or 100 bucks and having rather than having to send it off to Nikon or Canon or whoever. Yeah. And I kind of back on the mirrorless thing. A lot of people, a mirrored camera actually is protecting your sensor from some of that dust. Uh, there were a lot of complaints, complaints early on with mirror, uh, excuse me, mirrorless cameras that they got more dust. Um, Canon on all of their mirrorless cameras. When you turn the camera off, it puts the shutter in front of the sensor to try to prevent that. Uh, my understanding is that Sony is now doing that on some of theirs and probably Nikon will be doing that also. So you'll just have to check on a camera by camera basis, so. Okay, uh, the next question, there was actually a whole lot of questions about Photoshop. And I'll start at the top. Uh, one person who asked one of the questions was, I'm using Photoshop elements. I'm entirely self-taught. 
Uh, I use a workflow that I developed and I didn't even know that phrase workflow existed. And then there was all of these questions kind of fell in the area of what do you recommend? What do you use? Do you recommend Photoshop? Do I, should I use Lightroom? Uh, advantages and disadvantages. So I'm gonna uh, try to set the stage with sort of an overview of Photoshop and Lightroom and then try to hopefully answer a lot of these questions in, in one blow, so. And wait, hang on a second. Somebody just in a chat. <laughs> I think we have a question. So somebody was saying goodbye, I think. It, it oh, okay. Up. Yeah, Chris oh. just left. That's all. All right. Okay. So let me just start. Uh, I, I did a really brief overview of photography workflow. It's kind of three components. You want to manage the images, which is import, sorting, categorizing, storing, backing up. You want to edit your images and then prepare them for export and or print. And I kind of asked myself the generic question, <laughs> what products do this? So real key, uh, the first thing here is the Adobe Photography Plan. And we're going to go on that in a little bit more in depth in a second. Uh, but there are other products. There are products like On One, Capture One, uh, even the Photos app in Apple. There's a new product or a fairly new product called Skylum Luminar, uh, DxO Photos. There's, there's just a ton of them out there. I don't know if any of them do everything. Uh, there's also web-based tools and you have the ability to mix and match all of these things to get to where you want to be. So, uh, yeah. so I, I, I stole this right off of Adobe's pay, uh, photography page. If we're going to talk about Lightroom and Photoshop, I mean, you have to say Adobe is the 800 pound gorilla in the room. They're the dominant player, which is why a lot of people use them. Um, we throw around the term Lightroom and Photoshop a lot, but Adobe has managed to confuse everybody in the last few years with some of their marketing and advertising. But what they currently offer, these products used to be standalone and you paid for them one at a time. But basically where Adobe has gone is to a subscription service which they call their photography plan. And these products that you see listed up here are what you get with one of their photography plans for the most part. We'll, we'll go through that in a minute. So when we, most of the people here, I think in the photography club, when we say Lightroom, we're actually meaning this product here in the center called Lightroom Classic. That is the full featured Lightroom that used to be standalone. Uh, Photoshop is Photoshop. Uh, one of the person, one of the people that asked a question said they use Photoshop Elements. There is a subset of Photoshop called Photoshop Elements. It's a standalone product still. Um, it, it, again, a subset of Photoshop. Uh, a few years ago, Adobe decided to also bring out a mobile product which they now call Lightroom, which is part of the confusion. Uh, yeah. So Lightroom is a, a mobile version of Lightroom Classic, but without all the features and everything is run through the cloud. <laughs> and also now in the plan, you get Photoshop Express and Photoshop Camera. And we're not gonna touch on those. They're, they're actually for your mobile devices, which Photoshop Lightroom also works on your mobile devices. And so in that photography plan, they have three ways of selling it to you. Again, it's on a monthly basis. You can pay your $10 a month and you get a terabyte and you only get Lightroom, which by, is the mobile and desktop version. You don't get Lightroom Classic, which is the full feature of Lightroom. To get that, you jump over to the photography, this other plan in the middle it decreases the amount of cloud storage you have, but you get Lightroom Classic and Photoshop, the actual full featured versions. And if you wanna jump up to $20 a month, you get all of that plus a terabyte of cloud storage. So 
I think most of us, when we're here in the photography club, when we say Lightroom, we're really referring, and I'm going to back page, to this product called Lightroom Classic. Um, there'll probably be a day when Lightroom, the mobile version, has all the same features, but I think we're several, several years away. So for the rest of this talk, when I say Lightroom, I'm going to be referring to Lightroom Classic and or the full featured Photoshop. And so what are the differences? Uh, Lightroom was really designed from the ground up to be a product for photographers. And it also does all the database management, cataloging, and, and you can do your editing. It does non-destructive editing. And truthfully, for most photographers, it's probably 90% of whatever you need. Uh, you can do global and local edits. Uh, it actually does a pretty good job with panos and HDR. Uh, I think it's a little bit easier to learn. And it also accepts a lot of plugins. So there are a lot of other products out there that specifically address one need, like Topaz, who goes, or uh, uh, Silver FX Pro, which is only meant to edit black and white. You can plug those all into Lightroom and jump over very easily and use those tools and it then it puts your edits from those plugins back into the Lightroom database. Photoshop has the ability to all the same editing tools as Lightroom plus some others. It does not have a database for cataloging. The two key things I think that are, are that are really different that you might need are you have the ability to do layers. And layers is imagine back in the day when we did uh, overhead projectors and you threw one slide down. Well, instead of creating a whole new slide, you just threw something that didn't lay over the other one. I mean, I didn't block the uh, text on another one. It's sort of like that. You can basically, it allows you to combine a lot of different photographs or uh, graphic design pieces with your photographs and then combine them into one layer. And uh, when you saw Rachel's demo of putting four photographs together for stacking, that's an example of the use of layers. Uh, you could layer hundreds of things together. So uh, also Photoshop allows you to do pixel level editing. And I mean, literally you could go down to one pixel at a time and change the color and the luminosity. Uh, you, you could do anything. If, if you've got enough time to do every pixel on a, on a picture, you can make Richard Nixon, Richard Nixon look like JFK. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it does, it's, it's a better use for image manipulation. Uh, it has really advanced uh, panel capability and HDR. There's more brushes and filters. If you need to do graphics, you know, Photoshop's where you got to go. Um, it is a longer learning curve. It's a product that's been around a long time, so I don't think it's nearly as intuitive <laughs> uh, just because of the, uh, the history of the product and where it's come from. So... So who are the users? Lightroom, I, I think, is, is basically just for photographers, where Photoshop is photographers, graphic artists, illustrators, anybody who needs to manipulate an image in any way to a great extent. Um, Photoshop is, is where, where you go for that. And kind of an example, I actually just stole this also from Adobe's website. <laughs> If you look at the image on the left, that's a Lightroom would be perfect for this. I got a dog looking through the ferns. You know, I want to highlight certain things. I want to make sure it's sharp. I maybe want to adjust the saturation. All done right over here. If you look at this image over here, this is what you can do in Photoshop. Maybe there was a photo of a young girl leaning on a chair. Everything else has been manipulated. The, the aquarium behind this, you know, the window, her legs becoming a fishtail, uh, all of that. I mean, literally, if you have the time, you can do in Photoshop. 
So if you want to do the layers, pixel level editing, if you want to create something out of your mind that doesn't exist, you have to go to Photoshop. Lightroom is more about how do I adjust an existing photograph? So here's an example. This is something I did in Photoshop. This actually was an image uh, of a sculpture we had here in Jackson and one shot of the stars. But using Photoshop, I made it look like the stars were falling down into a trough or a canyon in the sky. And that was all done in Photoshop by just manipulating that image, copying it literally 50 or 60 times and telling it to move the stars towards this spot. So there's no way you can do that in Lightroom. Uh, that doesn't exist in the real world. <laughs> so, uh, so kind of back to some of these questions. Uh, what do we recommend? I, I use the Adobe Photo Suite. I pay the monthly. I know some people don't like paying a monthly fee, but in, I think in the long run, it's actually cheaper than rebuying everything every few years. Uh, you know, uh, do I recommend Photoshop? I would say only if you really want to go into image manipulation. Otherwise, I think Lightroom, again, like I said earlier, does 90% of what most of us want to do. Uh, do I use something else? Uh, I will say this, I have a copy of Luminar, which is a really interesting product. Uh, it, it will do almost everything Lightroom will do. It'll do some of the things, Photoshop, it actually has layers. Um, the reason I actually purchased it, I do, a, I still take a lot of pictures with my phone and I have them in uh, Apple's Photos product. Luminar, when they first came out, allowed you to use, put it as a plugin on top of the Apple Photos app. And I went, okay, they don't have very many editing tools. I would use that as an editor for a lot of snapshots and stuff. <clears throat> it's a, maybe a little bit easier to use product than Lightroom, but also very powerful. So um, what advantages would a dedicated or amateur gain in learning Photoshop? I, if you're already comfortable with Lightroom, unless you want to start compositing images or, you know, like, hey, you're at the limit. I, there's something I want to do. I just can't. Lightroom doesn't allow me. Then, yeah, you could probably do it in Photoshop. If you need to do layers or, you know, create an image that doesn't exist, then uh, I, I, I and. Also, I think you want to use Photoshop for printing, but we're going to let Barney get to all that later. That's one of his questions. Uh, and photo stacking. Well, that's layers. Yeah. Yeah. So anything you have to do with layers, then yeah. So stacking is one of those. Uh, really big panoramas are another one. You know, if, if you're shooting nine shot panoramas, uh, with a medium format camera, <clears throat> you probably want to do that with Photoshop. <laughs> so even though Lightroom will let you do panos also. Um, easiest way to learn. Um, this is a tough one. I, I have to say, I took a Photoshop class and it was so oriented towards graphic arts and illustration, I learned very little about photography, what, what I really wanted to do. So I would just say, if you take a, Photoshop class or look at anything online, make sure it's oriented towards some things you know, specific like stacking or panos or uh, exactly what you have in mind before you spend a lot of time with it. Cause there's tons of Photoshop things on YouTube and on the internet. And uh, kind of how you learn and, and would TPC at a Photoshop class? I, we, I don't know, we'll have to think about it. We had so many questions on this topic uh, and the Lightroom and Photoshop classes in the past have been well attended. But we'll, we may try to get one going again, but uh, you gotta always have committed people. So 
And the last thing here, I would, oops, sorry. <laughs> but Hotel California. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the old, you can check in, but you can never leave, or you can check out, and you can never leave. Uh, when you do your edits in Lightroom, in particular, you can't take those edits to any other product. Uh, and this is true of all the products out there. So I would say no matter what you're looking at, just understand that once you're in their ecosystem, you're kind of there to stay. And, and there's some caveats on that. I think Rachel might could jump in here. I believe she does something a little different, <coughs> possibly just to stay out of that trap. Uh, but there is no standard on how to store your edits. So if you understand that you've spent a lot of time editing thousands of photographs and you decide to switch from Lightroom to DxO or from DxO to Lightroom, guess what? All of that stuff you did isn't gonna transfer. So, and, and that's true, not only of Adobe, that's true of everybody so far. There is no uh, industry standard on how to store uh, non-destructive edits. So, and it, uh, if anybody has a uh, caveat on that, I'm, I'm welcome to, uh, uh, I'm willing to let them uh, speak up right now before we go to the next slide. So, uh, David, just just for clarification purposes, um, if you decide to abandon uh, Lightroom uh, or or Photoshop for that matter, you basically you 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 export your image. And then all, all of those all of those edits that you did in that that image are essentially exported and, and stored as as a new image. So so you have your you have your final. Uh, I, ju ju I just want to make sure everybody understands what, what David's getting at is you can't go back in and then um, say, oh, I really wish I hadn't set the black point where I did. Let me move it. You can't. You you have to essentially take that flat that what I call the flattened image that's been exported and then put that into your new program and, and start uh, doing additional edits. That, that absolutely correct. Yeah, I didn't want to, uh, you can leave with your final images and your original images, but all of the, hey, I wanna go at, back and adjust that. I, I wanna tweak one thing. That's not possible. And, and again, that's true of every product that's out there on the marketplace right now, so. You can leave with your original image? Yeah, you can take your original raw files and you can take your final edits like a, in a TIFF file or something like that. Uh, it's just the way Lightroom works, it keeps all of that, you know, hey, I, I changed the saturation here. I changed this there. I, uh, I did a local adjustment all of that, uh, that interim pieces, that editing is gonna be lost because the other programs won't understand what, how Adobe handles it. Okay. Yeah, and I know that, that can be really confusing. So let's, uh, I'm glad Barney brought that up because it can be very unclear. You, you can keep your final image, your original raw photos, you can export, but if you switch, all of those, you know, uh, other things you did are going to be gone. So, all right, we had another question. When you inadvertently put a photo in the wrong folder, how do you get it into the correct folder? So actually, one image is real easy. Here's a little example. But the, the thing you have to do is you actually have to grab the image in the, in the image, not up here in the gray part. And if you have the appropriate folder, you want to go to, you would just click it and drag it to that folder. And you can drag multiple images if you want, but you do have to grab in the image. I would suggest if you have a lot of uh, different folders, make sure you have the folder somewhat visible to you because otherwise when you drag it over and start trying to find your folder, excuse me, uh, it's not, it will get there, but it's not real fast. <laughs> and it, kind of come scrolling by you. So I would find my original image 
and then scroll to the folder over in the navigator. And then you can just drag and drop them, but you do have to grab the image in the in the uh, actual photographic uh, part of the image, not in the gray area. Okay. And we had another question. Uh, I've been told to use the sharpen tool on my photos. Uh, I do so, but I don't see any differences. Should I be using it? What should I see as a result? Uh, so the first thing I would say, uh, well, if you're using Lightroom, it typically applies a little bit of sharpening depending on the camera and the metadata that it's looking at. Uh, you know, blow up your image to 100% or even two or 300. And, you know, you can move the sharpen slider and see if it's actually helping you or hurting you. Uh, I, I use this pretty sparingly, especially in, you know, the Adobe products. Uh, over sharpening or under sharpening can cause, or definitely over sharpening can cause a lot of artifacts. Uh, and, while it might look good at a normal size on your screen, when you blow it up or go to print it, you'll see these uh, artifacts. And if we, if we want, tell you what, I will give you an example real quick. So here's a picture of a falcon that, uh, oops. Uh, can y'all actually see the falcon, or did I need to? Oh, okay. Hang on a second. All right. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Um, feathers are a tough thing, and let me just move this over a little. Uh, can y'all see my cursor at this point? Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Yep. If I pull the sharpening all the way over, you sort of see what happens here. And I go the other direction and it goes away. But I'm going to just show you up. Uh, if I go up to 300%, I don't know if you can see it. It, it starts to the edges start to look funny. And if you see this on a large print, and I don't know if you can uh, tell on the screen you're looking at, but even in this uh, yellow area up here, you start to see all kind of little dots and things because I've over sharpened the image. I don't know if y'all can actually see them. I know Zoom probably doesn't get this, but it's pretty dramatic when I go all the way to the right here. Uh, versus all the way to the left, <laughs> where this looks really smooth. And now you suddenly, and sometimes you really notice over sharpening where you have a whole lot of consistent area, whether it's dark or light or whatever. Uh, and the noise reduction can affect this. You can change it with radius and whatnot, but um, you know, my, I guess my point on that is you wanna be a little, judicious on sharpening. Um, and I would say you have to just take a look at each individual photo and, and see um, what makes sense. And, but definitely kind of zoom in and look at the details. So, uh, all right, and let me go back to our, uh, also, if I really think of, I have a, pro a photo that I really need some sharpening. I will probably use a plugin. I like Topaz. Uh, the, the sliders in Lightroom are something of a blunt instrument. instrument so, uh, And the, the Topaz products are more intelligent in the way they sharpen things. Um, also, I got this question. I stumbled upon the auto haze removal feature in Photoshop Elements and worked well, but then it, I also tried it on some regular photographs and it seemed to help. Can you explain this? So 
Uh, I copied these two comments about D. Hayes. <laughs> uh, uh, Adobe has never really, I don't, I don't know if they've ever come out with a statement about everything the D. Hayes slider is doing. But there's one that says, oh, it's a physical model of how light is scattered and transmitted and yada, yada, and how it's absorbed in the atmosphere. Uh, and they look at metadata. Uh, but it definitely also adjusts the contrast and the saturation. And this quote was like in kind of an intelligent way so that the haze in the background gets removed without changing the contrast in the foreground. <laughs> but bottom line, whatever they're doing back there in the background, it will definitely uh, adjust enough in contrast and, and saturation that even on a, a photograph without any haze, you're gonna see changes and that's what's happening. Um, my one comment about the dehaze filter is it's really cool, but it's a kind of a sledgehammer uh, and it won't fix smoke in the sky like we've had this past summer. <laughs> You'll get some really weird effects. And so I would say use it sparingly. It's really useful. Uh, but not a cure-all for everything, so. All right, we got another question getting further into Photoshop. It says, I'm working in a photo in Photoshop, which has multiple layers and complicated selections. I, I spent a lot of time and it saves to Lightroom. I mean, how can I save the Lightroom without losing all the layers and all the information in the alpha channel? So saying merely saving it as a PSD doesn't work. So this one, we're gonna make a couple of assumptions here. So my little graphic over here with the arrows, you have a photo in Lightroom that you've said, edit in Adobe Photoshop, which you would do by hitting the edit in and it will pop up where do you want to edit? And in my case, I could oops, say Photoshop or Luminar or open it as a smart object in Photoshop. But it then transferred that up to Photoshop, which now this person has created other layers to work on. And when they've saved it, it's come back to Lightroom. And we're, we're going to assume they said save it as a PSD file, which is a Photoshop file, which keeps all the layers. But now they've gone to work on it again and they want to transfer it back to Photoshop. So once they go through this process again, it always pops up this other dialog box. It says edit a copy with adjustments or edit original. And I, we, we think the point of their, I mean, to answer their question was if you say edit original, it will move the full layered PSD file back to Lightroom. I mean, excuse me, back to Photoshop. Uh, and I don't David? Know. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I actually was, I was thinking more about this question and, and just, just to kind of uh, go 360 on it, um, the, uh, the other comment I, I wanted to make is if the person started the image and, and, and did the layers in Photoshop, um, um, and then, uh, and then, and then um, brought the image into into the Lightroom catalog. I mean, that that will not preserve those layers. That uh, actually, when you bring the image into Lightroom, uh, Lightroom catalog, you're you're bringing it in. I mean, this is from an outside source. Now, uh, you're you're bringing that you're bringing that in essentially as a flattened image. Right. So kind of elaborate on what Barty's saying. Uh, in Photoshop, if you have layers, uh, you can preserve it with all the layers or you can flatten it, which takes it down to one layer. At that point, you can't work on those layers anymore <laughs> or on individual layers. Uh, so, you know, I know the person who asked this question isn't online here tonight. So we're kind of making the assumption they went from Lightroom to Photoshop to Lightroom to Photoshop. But as Barney's saying, if they started in Photoshop, there's no way to fix it. I mean, they, they, we, you know, you can't do, uh, you can't preserve those layers. And uh, so, yeah, there are some limits of what you can do. Um, oh, okay. Also, we had a question on what are the various ways to use the range mask 
with the adjustment brush and the radial filters and the graduated filters, and then color and luminance, what are the steps to identify the line where there'll be no impact. And as I said here, this is time for a demo. <laughs> so hang on just a second. Okay, let's get a different picture here. <clears throat> here we are in Lightroom, and I take a picture of the sky because I think this is easier to demonstrate some of the things that are happening. Uh, so if we do, you know, this graduated filter and we pull it down, when you have nothing but a blue background here, it kind of shows you ideally what you're looking at. If you go down here and hit the show selected mask, you can see how it fades it from uh, more change to less change, I guess. is. And if we were to pull the whole thing down, you would see it. You know, the red is sort of indicating how it's fading from one area to the other. Now, if uh, we turn that off, and change the exposure, you can see pretty graphically how that's changing. So you have to kind of be aware of what this fade looks like, either indicated by showing the mask or turning it off and looking at it. And also kind of the question on the range mask, you can actually click on this and if you wanted to change color, uh, well, this might be demonstrated with a one <laughs> color option here, but um, you could also, you can change the range of luminance you wanna change by using these sliders here. So again, you can see kind of with this one color uh, image, what's happening. If I move these over here and move this one that way, it changes this one differently. So I, I think it's a kind of a good learning tool if you just get a shoot a picture of the sky and you can graphically see what these are doing to you as you move them around. Uh, let me hit David, me what's that one you're using that um, affects the edges? The edges, so let me go back and just do the whole thing again. Uh, oops, sorry. So I'm using a graduated filter. Right. But then if you go down here and turn the range mask on. Okay. It'll let you selectively use either color or luminance. So what I, I think what you're asking is I did luminance and you can actually show the mask on that and it'll show you how it's changing things. And I turn that off. But if you move these sliders, you can move around. Oops, sorry. I need to change the exposure. And you just have to play around with these to see how they're affecting your image. But it's, you know, it's easy to do, just take a picture of the sky and you can actually get a good idea how these are working. You know, you can make this more narrow and more defined. Let me hit reset and that'll be gone. You also can do that with uh, the brush tool. So when you use the brush tool, I think y'all can see it on the screen there, you can change the size with the slider or you know, use it on your cursor. But the feather also affects sort of how it blends into everything and also the flow. So if I was to do, well, I'll tell you what, we'll leave one at 100% flow with almost no feather. And if I was to do that across like this, and change the exposure, you see what it did. 
I go the other way, it does this with exposure. Now, if I went in and changed the flow and the feather and did it again, oops. Uh, okay, let me hit reset, we'll do a different one. So with these settings, you see it's much less of an effect. I, I don't know if you, can y'all see that on your screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll even hit the DI. So, so we have to do a whole lot more. The flow, you have to go over it a lot more times to start to see the effect. So what does flow actually um, I guess flow would be how much, if you were imagining using a paint can, yeah. flow is how much paint you're spewing out, where size obviously is pretty intuitive, but okay. the feather is the blending part, whether it's a hard edge or a softer edge. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, and again, we can always reset all these and start over. So um, let's see. It was kind of a, another part of that question. Ah, here we go. We're going to switch to a different photograph. So using these, uh, let's just use this brush tool. And let me... I'm going to change the flow back to 100 in this. And you can do these always keyboard shortcuts. But I'm going to brush over these aspen trees. And let's see. Let's see if we can see that mask. You know, we'll do a little bit more. So if we go to this range mask, and I did, well, well, let's let's do, well, no, let's do color. You can use this picker tool and pick those colors. And if I turn off this mask and go up here and change the I've brightened all of those up that only relate to that color. And you can see I left the other ones alone over here. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but uh, you can use the color picker and the luminance to, and, and because it only works on those colors you pick, it didn't change uh, anything else. Now you can see actually it did change a little bit of this green tree, but guess what, on color theory, what's green made out of, you know, or yellow and greens uh, have a lot of the same uh, uh, pigments in them for one of a better term, I guess. But- uh, Did it make you know, a difference that you didn't put the, the little picker back in the circle? Uh, what was the question again? Go down, slide down, where you got the, okay, see the empty circle there where it says, uh -huh. does it make a difference if you put it back in there? You click it in there. Uh, well, let's see. Nope. Oh, but okay. basically it allows you to- There was a reason to put it back because the things I've seen on YouTube said, make sure you put it back. Well, and it may be true if you want to do a different range you know, an, another adjustment. I don't know, Barney, do you have any uh, insight on that or Rachel? But yeah, I mean, that's, that's uh, basically, I, I, uh, go ahead. I don't have anything to add to that, okay, David. Okay. I'm gonna just reset that, but 
Uh, I think that's kind of the heart of the question. You use uh, those tools you know, and mask, and you can turn the mask on and off. Uh, and with the color picker, you can, it gives you finer control in Lightroom than you've had before. Uh, I, ha I have one other question about that. Okay. With the range mask, do it with, go ahead and, and turn that on. Okay. Well, I, I've reset everything. So you want me to? Any one of them. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Let me just um, color go, back, go down and turn on. Okay. Um, do luminance. Luminance. Okay. Okay. Um, now, where it says range and it has a triangle on both ends. Yep. What does the triangle on the left, how is it different than what goes on in the right? Let's say we wanted to just darken the sky, but we didn't want to darken a uh, Mount Moran. Um, all right. So these two sliders are, you're basically going from light to dark. Okay, so, go back and do it. Um, with the box on the top. I tell you what, hang on a second. And maybe if we, uh, so if I move it over here, you're, you're uh, let me see if I can explain this. You're adjusting different luminance values. Is uh, Maybe that's the correct way to show it, to say it. And well, let's not turn the mask on. But you can see if I move this one on the left, you're you're narrowing the range of luminance you want to change. Does that make sense? Hmm, not really. What I'm what I use that often for is when I wanted to say darken the sky and there's a mountain in the middle of it that I don't want to impact. Okay. So start all over again. No, don't don't use that one. Go yes, use that. Go to like this. Okay, slide it down, yeah. All right. But now I just want to darken the sky, but I don't right. want to impact the mountain. Luminance, let's go luminance. Hit the uh, show I, selected mask over. Uh, which, which one? Um, hit O and it'll do it. Okay, yeah, I'm not quite sure because I, 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 this is not how I would, it's, it's showing that, but that's gonna do, See, I, 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 thought, I would actually use I the brush that, tool. That when you hit the range would mask the mountain so it wasn't impacted and the sky would be impacted, but maybe I'm understanding yeah. it wrong. Well, okay, but here's your issue. If the value of the sky, even though it's blue, and the value of the mountain, which is gray, are the same, trying to adjust luminance isn't going to help you any. Okay, so if, somebody, was, if somebody the correct mountain me. was in shadows, it would. Yes, but on this particular picture, I don't think this would be the right thing to do. Okay. Uh, I would actually say, do this. I mean, again, I, I, I understand what you're trying to do, but I don't think this is a good example. But if you did it by color, maybe it would work. Right. So if we went in here and then said, turn this on color, and I went up here and pick that color. I mean, I could, you know, let's, let's turn off the mask. I mean, I could do that and make it dark or light, but I didn't really affect the mountain at all. Yeah, and, and it doesn't have that, the line around the mountain either. Uh, not as much. You, you do have to be a little careful on how you're uh, brushing that in. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. But so yeah, here's the problem. If, if you have two things, even though they're vastly different colors, 
but they're the same value of luminance, doing the graduated is, is not going to help you. You're right. <clears throat> All right. And let's see, where did I leave off? Questions. <laughs> um, oh. Okay, through that, and let's see. Oh, <laughs> uh, I use the adjustment brush a lot and almost always set the flow to 100. But it, well, basically the person's going, it seems to change. And okay, we're going to have to go back to <laughs> Lightroom for this. So. Just what we were doing. Uh, let's just do this. And you see these adjustments. Let me just set this flow at 100 and brush something. And now I go to this other image. It's left the flow at wherever I put it. Um, and they're really asking is, is there any way to always have it reset to a hundred? Uh -huh. And I, I don't know if that's possible. I, I haven't been able to figure that one out. Anytime you wanna set any of these sliders back to zero, you typically click on the name. So if you see, if I did this and then click, it goes back to zero and it does that on flow, but I don't know how to make it uh, always set to this when you switch to a different image. So you see, if I switch to this image, it's at 100. But if I put it at 39 and I switch to this image, it's at 39. You can always double click, but I don't know how to globally make everything go back to zero. And if anybody knows that answer, please let me know. <laughs> David? Uh, if you double click on the word effect, doesn't that take everything back to zero? It, it does I, and everything in here, but, it, but I do not, not believe it'll do it on the brushes. Oh, too bad. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I tried it several times and it, you can see it's always, uh, this little panel right here seems to stay at wherever it was at before. And again, if anybody has a better answer than that one, please let me know. You can always, again, go up here, to, uh, just like Charlotte said, if you hit effect, it changes everything in that panel, but not this panel. So again, what's the effect of effect? Well, the effect is just, uh, is this particular panel that has all of these sliders in it. So let me, uh, if you can see the screen, I'll move them all over here. But if I hit effect, it moves them all back to zero. Okay. And, and matter of fact, clicking on any of the names will move any slider back to zero. It just doesn't, because it's in a different panel, it doesn't affect the flow which always seems to stay wherever you left it when you go to the next photo. I'm sure Adobe would say that's not a bug, that's a feature, so. And this is a nice shot of our helicopter that's moving all the trees off our new ski run, so. Uh, let's see. Ah, my last question here. <laughs> I need someone to walk me through step by step moving my photos from my iMac into Lightroom. So I will send this link later, but basically, if you go into photos and choose the file, 
uh, drag down, then it says export. If you say export unmodified original, if you highlight all your photos, it will take every photo out and put them wherever in whatever file or folder you want. And then you would re-import those into Lightroom. And I'll be happy to send this. I'll I'll pass this link along uh, is, to the person who sent the photo the the question. Is this the same with I, is this the same with your iPhone? Well, the Photos app is on your Mac, so anything you take with your phone in the Apple world winds up in the Photos app. Mm -hmm. And if you ever wanted to get those out and put them in Lightroom. Uh, you can export them one at a time, but uh, if you don't want any of the changes that were made in Lightroom, say export unmodified original. And, oh, oops, sorry. Uh, huh? And it has a couple of other questions about, you know, XMP files and things like that, so. But basically, that's how you do it. You do have the ability to get everything out of your photos app. And I think that's my last question. We're going to turn it over to Barney, unless anybody has any clarifying, if I need to clarify anything I said. So well, this was helpful. You see my screen? Yep. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I, I'm actually going to go pretty pretty quick here. And um, for the, for those of the because because of the hour, I I, I think we uh, we ought to send all, all all of you guys a certificate of achievement for hanging in there this long. Um, but um, um, for for those that the, the questions that are coming my way, uh, you can certainly feel free to contact me directly and I can go into to a little bit more detail, but I'm going to kind of, there's a lot of text here. There's not a lot of debt. There's not, there are no demos. So most of what uh, I'm going to say is going to be in the text. I was, I was thinking that we might run a little bit long anyway. So, so let's just jump right into this. Um, um, how do you do high key photography in outdoor setting without additional light? Um, you know, what, what are the settings? What do you look like in the, for the composition and the, and the background? Well, um, uh, high key shooting uh, basically is overexposing your image, and so you want to be able you want to you want to choose your setting such that um, it's amenable to uh, essentially your your subject uh, still showing through when you overexpose. And when you overexpose, you're talking about two and a half or three EV units, and so you can go ahead and just you know dial up your dial it up on your camera and shoot it, look at the back and say, is that getting close to what I want or is it not? Um, the, uh, you know, a couple of examples, shooting bison in the snow, birds on, on water under a cloudy sky. These are the, those are the classic or any animal in the, uh, on the snow is, is a classic example of, of uh, being able to shoot high key. Now, you know, typically we, we go ahead and when we're in snow, we're shooting uh, one and a half or two stops over. So you just be kicking that up, uh, you know, an additional um, um, one or two, two, uh, um, two, ex two exposure units and uh, look into the back of the camera and see if that's what, see if that's what, you, what, you're, what you're getting. Now, if you're, um, um, uh, the, the, other, the, the other primary time to actually do this obviously is when um, it's, uh, you know, high noon or thereabouts. So between 10 and three harsh, harsh light conditions, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing that you're going for when, uh, when you want to shoot, uh, shoot high key. So I, I add, a, I add a, a caveat here because most of the time, you know, we're shooting early in the morning, we're shooting the, in the evenings. Um, uh, and we want to go ahead and say, well, maybe I'd, I'd like to see what this looks like in high key. So here are a couple of examples. Now this is, uh, taken a few years back at, uh, up in Yellowstone um, at the uh, the Wolf and Bear uh, uh, place uh, at uh, at West Yellowstone, these two guys kind of got into it in the snow. 
you know, we're shooting from a deck, we're looking directly in and, and I just expose this as I normally would. Now, if I wanna make this go ahead more of a high key, then basically all, all I need to do is, is to, uh, you know, push the, the exposure unit up. And in this case, it was uh, um, 3.85 and I just did that in Lightroom. I just took the exposure, I just pushed it over. Now, some of the other, the other aspects of the image are gonna start to look pretty bad. And so, you know, do the things that you normally do. Play with the, with the black point, do a little bit of dehaze work, especially when you do in high key, you'll be amazed at how much more information kind of comes back into your, uh, into your image. So that's, that's how you can do it in the field uh, or in Lightroom. Now, uh, when you get into doing it in, in Photoshop, it becomes a little bit more of a, 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 of a problem and you're going to end up spending a lot more time. So here's an image that I took at the uh, um, cow cutting competition um, in July at the at the county fair, and what I what I got what I wanted to get to is is this. Now, nothing here in the left hand side, to, you know, is is directed towards high key, and I knew that, but God, this guy was just so interesting. So what I did was to um, um, carefully. Um, remove him, remove the part of him that I wanted, um, uh, in, in and and put him, put that onto another layer, and uh, and and then a, a subsequent layer which I made all white, um, uh, and then and then and then the, the the person was put put on top of that. Now we we get into so I'm, I'm talking about layers. I'm talking about masking. Uh, it, they're they're two um, um, topics that we could spend hours and hours ta talking about, but um, it's the power of Photoshop to be able to mask things in and out of, of your image and make corrections. Um, so extract, this, uh, extract the subject, place it on a white, uh, a white or off-white canvas, uh, blend the image, image that you, uh, of, of, the, of the individual or object, um, and you do this with, with varying uh, brushes and burning and dodging and the like. Um, and then darken the area that's important. And for me, the, the area that I really wanted to emphasize was the hands and the face. And um, um, that, that I of course did in, uh, it, this was all done in, in Photoshop. So uh, another example is uh, this, this, uh, th this woman who was also in the uh, cow cutting competition. And the, the initial image that I got was, was shown there. I, I did some work in, in Lightroom to brighten up the shadow uh, under, under the brim of her hat. Um, but uh, this really wasn't getting, it was getting close to where I was at, but I still had problems with the background and all. So it was a matter of doing a similar sort of thing of extracting her out of the image and then putting her into a, a more defined background uh, or, or fixing that. I think in this case, what I did is actually just brushed in the, the, the background around her. So those are a couple of quick, quick and easy techniques that you can apply to, to uh, uh, make, uh, make your image or, or attempt to make an image uh, um, high key uh, in Photoshop. Um, if, if, uh, if, and if anybody has any questions about that, feel free to contact me and, and we can, you know, we, I, I can, I, we, we can, we can go through the process, um, uh, you know, over, over a Zoom call uh, very easily. But basically it, it will um, um, understand how to, how to generate a mask and how to put it into a separate layer and then you're, you're three quarters of the way home. So there's there's a uh, number of questions that came out on the on the Wacom tablet. Um, how do you use the tablet um, in uh, in editing images in Lightroom and Photoshop? What's your opinion of using that rather than a mouse? How long did it take you to learn to use it? Well, here's an example for those of you that don't know what it, what uh, a Wacom tablet is. is is basically it's uh, it's a pad um, that's about the size of a of a uh, a, a, a legal pad or for Rachel's uh, 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 benefit, A3 size. Um, and, and, and basically what the, the advantage of that is that you're using a, 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 the equivalent of a, of a pencil and a pencil point uh, as opposed to a mouse. Um, and so you gotta be thinking about uh, fine control. 
Um, so um, that's that's how I use it. Um, I have I have both uh, a a four and a five. I keep one out here and I keep the other one back in uh, back in Chapel Hill um, because it's for for fine editing purposes. It's it, it's great. Um, and uh, but you know I can't tell you how many that last that last statement many buy it and never use it because they think that it's just it just gets too complicated and you can make this thing as complicated as you want and my advice is don't do that keep it simple um, so these are all the these are all kind of the, the caveats that that you know for for people that are going to come in a little bit later on, but you know, keep it simple um, because you're going to get lost and you're going to get frustrated with all the different buttons and and uh, and menus and sub menus that you can can put in this. So my advice to this person that 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 that's getting a tablet or has the, has the tablet is turn off all the buttons and all the the radio wheel settings. Um, map the area of the tablet to the upper left corner. And basically what that means is that when you move the pen across the tablet, you go up that upper left-hand corner, you can move, move it like you move your cursor on your screen very quickly, uh, as opposed to having to drag it all the way across the paper. And, and you, set up, you set up your pressure sensitive pen uh, like, uh, like this. And, and the, the important, important aspects of this are, are and these are, the, these are basically the, the, the adjustments that you would make is that you turn off this double double tap because when you're using a tablet it's amazing how many times you lift the lift your 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 pencil point off the paper and put it back down again and double tapping uh, does all sorts of things as we know from working with uh, working with a mouse so that gets turned off and the other thing is that on these pens you have a uh, you have a, a, a little um, slide clicking, a little clicking, clicking uh, switch, slide uh, um, toggle switch. And uh, you can, the, I set the top one um, with the commands in Photoshop to, up for, to undo, um, and then the bottom one for, for right click. And, and those are, with, with this, you can just, you just put on keystroke and then a menu comes up and you type in the keystrokes for that command. And then and that's done. And then uh, right click is just one of the things that you uh, that you, that you choose. So that's a that's a um, the other oh the other thing too that I turn off is the touch control because you can use these pads much like you do um, a uh, um, uh, the, the the pad on your computer. And I personally find that to be very annoying. So um, I keep it very very simple. Um, I use the pen. Um, to to do some very specific editing, uh, some fine editing um, that I, I get very frustrated um, using a mouse for. Um, it it's a worthwhile product, um, but it's not. I mean, um, when you get it, play with it um, and and turn off all those things and just use it like you would uh, like you would use your use your use your mouse. Um, Okay, very briefly, um, um, what should we do in Lightroom right before we send an image to printing? Well, you obviously you complete all your post-processing post edits. Um, if you're gonna ask me how to print out of Lightroom, you're asking the wrong person because I never print out of Lightroom. I find it confusing. I find it uh, unrewarding. I send everything over to Photoshop and I do my final resizing. Uh, and then the other tip here is to save that that file when it's in Photoshop with a name that has print in it and the and the image size. And I I, I, I do a lot of printing for clients, and and I find that uh, you know if, if it's a if it's a double image on a on a 17 by 22, well it's I, I have double um, uh, underscore um, 17 uh, x 22 underscore and then the, and then their file name um, and then it goes into a special folder for prints um, and that way I can always I can always find it uh, find it again 
Um, how critical is the aspect ratio? And uh, well, uh, let me just add one other thing. I'm, I'm not sure whether it's going get to co get covered again. Um, um, I, I have, I, I'm able to get much more control of my print coming out of Photoshop than I can out of Lightroom. Um, and for all of the, the printing things that you do, and we're going to talk a little bit about this later on when somebody asks a, que ask a question about what paper should I use, uh, always make sure that your ICC profile for the paper that you're using is loaded into the program because that is absolutely critical. You, will, you can get really muddy, mushy prints if you don't set that up properly. Um, printing, you know, what, what, I, what, I tell, what I tell artists is that, you know, look, if you want to get in the printing, that's fine, but it's just, you know, do you want to paint or do you want to print? Um, because uh, you're going to spend a lot of time learning how to do, how to, how to make good prints. And then you're also going to spend a lot of time keeping your printer up, uh, up and operational because it's not a, it's not something that you can just put in the closet and then pull out every two or three months and, and think that it's going to work again. So, uh, so let me just say, let me just leave that topic and go on to how critical is the aspect ratio and which should you use? I, I think it's obvious to, to, to uh, you know, what, what, what is it that you like? And, and so it's, it's, again, one of these personal choices. Uh, I always recommend people generate, you know, multiple dupes in, in, in Lightroom and then crop them um, and uh, um, have three or four or five of them, uh, leave them there for, you know, come back in a couple of days and pull them back up and say, which one do I like? Um, I know we've got some people in the club, myself included, that really like a square format. Um, and, and, uh, and sometimes, but sometimes square format's not going to work and you really need to go pano. So yeah, um, play with the different kinds and uh, different, different choices and see, see what works for your image and what you like. Um, how important is it? And uh, well, um, uh, David's already really, really um, uh, touched on, on, on all of this. And, and the only, the only uh, additional point to make here is remember that your raw files contain no sharpening and, and they, they don't, it's, it's just raw data. That's all it is. And, and so uh, everything is going to be a little bit dull. It's going to be unsaturated. It's going to be, uh, 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 it's going to be slightly soft. That's what we see in, in our, in our raw files. And, and then we move on in Lightroom or, or some other programs to uh, go ahead and uh, um, generate the uh, get, generate the final product. So this is the this is the other question. You know, what paper should we use? Well, um, for colors for color images, uh, a lot of people print on luster or some type of a gloss paper, or some type of a metallic uh, gloss paper. <laughs> You've got we've got more choices now than we have ever had as far as paper, uh, paper choices go. Uh, for black and white images, it's even, it's even greater uh, because you can do uh, different types of luster with different types of finishes on them, matte, fine art papers. So uh, here's, here's my advice is, is if you, uh, and, I, and I've actually done this, um, go to a place like IT supplies and I, it doesn't have to be IT supplies. It can be B and H. It could be, uh, you know, your, 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 uh, your uh, supplier of choice uh, and look up for, look at sample packs um, and um, um, IT supplies, for example, has 24 manufacturers, different manufacturers that sell sample packs and you can get, for example, uh, and you buy these sample packs in a um, um, in a particular class of papers. So, for example, fine art papers, and you'll typically get um, um, five or six different types of papers, uh, eight by ten, and you get two sheets uh, of each. Um, and you can go ahead and print your image on, or print two images on 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 one sheet. Again, remember to set your ICC profile, go download it from the manufacturer, uh, put, it into, put it into Photoshop, um, set that ICC profile correctly, and then, uh, then you can go ahead and make, make a judgment uh, as to what paper, what paper you like. 
Um, this is a big one. Um, scanning negatives to, to make prints. Uh, this particular person has a great Hasselblad uh, camera that they got. Um, they're shooting now some black and white film um, and they have an Epson V600 scanner, which is a very, very nice scanner, by the way, with an insert that he, that, that he or she can go ahead and, and do their uh, uh, 120 negatives on. Um, for some reason, they're using view scan. And so um, one of the things that I'm going to make a comment on is, is to um, uh, ask them to also try to use the Epson software that goes along with the V600, because that's actually pretty good. ViewScan software was written um, um, mainly to support um, um, these old, our, our older flatbed scanners, like the one that I've got, which is now about 15 or 16 years old, which was state of the art at, at its time, and it's still a very, very good scanner. But Epson and Nikon and, and, uh, and, and the others have have long ago given up updating that software. And so this person came along and wrote, wrote ViewScan, which is a nice universal uh, piece, of, piece of software that gives you a lot of control. So uh, in, in response to this question, um, my, my uh, you know, um, how is the final print size related to the scanning parameters? Well, it's critical that you got to get this right. If you don't get this right, then you're going to have to go back and do it again. And scanning is time consuming. I mean, this is a, this is a retiree's hobby um, to go ahead and scan images. Um, and that's one of the things that I'm doing right now myself uh, is uh, scanning, um, uh, scanning a la large library of 35 millimeter slides. But that's another topic. So um, typically for printing, you, uh, you know, you uh, for printing scans at, uh, at least you, you want the you want the scans at the at the, the highest highest setting, and a good uh, a good starting point is is 24 D, DPI, and you want to set the bit depth at the highest setting as well, which is at which is at 48. Now, just one comment about bit depth when bit depth when it comes to um, um, channels uh, and 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 scanning. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, a bit depth of 16 is the same as the bit depth of 48 uh, in 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 scanner li lingo because it's it's 16 bits per channel and 16 plus 16 plus 16 is 48. In our in our uh, normal world of photography. Um, 16 bits means 16 bits of the red, green, and blue channel, which is essentially 48. So don't be confused by that. Um, set the bit depth at the highest setting. In this particular case, he's got Digital Ice. It's a fantastic program for doing dust removal and, and uh, scratch removal. Make sure that's turned on and, and then uh, um, um, you know go off and, and do your thing. I've already made this comment about uh, about uh, uh, old flatbeds and and using uh, using the scan um, the the uh, manufacturer's uh, um, scanning program. How should I set up the scanner? Um, well, um, I you know hard drive uh, space is so cheap now. You know, uh, don't worry about file size uh, unless your computer is going to get bogged down. Um, think about how large a print you want to make uh, or what you want to do with it. If you're going to just put this out on social media, then you don't even need to, you don't need to, to scan at 1200 by 1200. You could, you could get away with a 300 by 300 <coughs> because it's, it, it's, a, it's going to be a very, very, very small image. But if you're going to make a print and, and typically for, uh, for, for normal uses, you know, four by four, four by eight or eight by eight, then, then I, I would start off with these parameters. Um, and and you'll be able to manipulate your image and actually make it bigger uh, if you need to do that, especially if you're uh, if you're putting on putting on a, on a, a soft background like canvas, um, you'll be able to blow it up uh, much bigger and uh, and get a very uh, decent result. Um, what's the appropriate uh, settings for scanning black and white 120 negatives? Well, set the software to film black and white negative, save in a TIFF format, scan at uh, uh, 2400, digital ice on, and remember to clean off the glass and the negative. Um, do this um, 
most every time. Buy yourself a nice soft um, um, paintbrush and keep it clean and just use it for cleaning off the glass. <coughs> Excuse me. Once you're ready to start, hit the preview button first to make sure it, it's doing what you want to do. And then go ahead and hit scan. And let me tell you, a 2400 by 2400 scan is going to take you take some time. So like I say, go off and get a cup of coffee. But you're going to have a, a, a nice file once you're finished. Um, I think David already, already touched on this. So I'm, I'm, uh, um, I wasn't sure whether he was going to include that or not. Um, and, but uh, basically, we're, we're saying the exact same thing. Um, uh, as far as whether it's going, I, I like his graphic better than, than, than this is Lightroom to Photoshop or Photoshop or whether you're starting in Photoshop and the like. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to, to, uh, reiterate that we've, we've, we've covered that. Um, so that's, that's, that's the, uh, that's a nickel tour through those, uh, those, uh, questions. Um, I, I know I went through them very quickly. I, I think the hours, the hour is very late. So. Um, if uh, anybody has uh, uh, wants some additional clarification on any of that, just let me know, and I will be uh, happy to spend the time with you and, and take you through step by step. Barney, David. I just oops. Yeah. Go ahead, Erica. Is that you? Yeah. That was me. I just had a quick question about the file naming convention that you had when you're sending it to Photoshop for resizing and naming the file. What file type should I be saving it as? As the P P D, you know, oh, as a photo. I, I, I say I I I always save them as TIFF files. Yeah. Um, okay. And, that's fine. And yeah, that's that that's basically yeah, and you can set up whatever you know, whatever uh um format for saving these these things that you that you like. But uh um, because I'm doing a lot of stuff for artists, they want they want things at different sizes, and sometimes, you know, um, two G clay prints on on one sheet on a 17 by 22, one on 11 by 11 by uh, by by uh, 17 or 13 by 17. So I, I, it's just a system that I that I developed. And um, uh, the night the the important thing about all of this is. Uh, and the reason why I emphasize save that as a print file is when you get into printing, you'll find that even if you have everything matched and coordinated between your screen calibration and your uh, and and your uh, and your printer, that you will be making little tweaks. And and for my uh, for for my work, I always find that I have to increase the exposure about a quarter of a stop. Um, and I do that as the very last thing. I do that in Photoshop, and um, so that 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 image then is is a little bit brighter. The exposure is up a little bit more than what the artist would would go ahead and post on their website or uh, the like. So it's something that you have to that you have to play with and 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 understand the characteristics of. You know your screen, even though it's calibrated, and your and your printer, and and the paper that you're using, and for for all my for all that artwork, I just push everybody towards uh, Epson Smooth Fine Art Paper because it's uh, because of its longevity and its and its and its reproduce reproducibility. For my own work, I don't do that. I don't use I don't use that fine art paper. I use a Hammer Mule set of uh, uh, um, uh, German etch, etching paper. And uh, uh, most recently, I'm anxious to try a Hammer Ham Mule um, um, metallic matte paper that uh, yeah. um, Brooke over showed me, which just blew me away. So, um, and boy, that stuff ain't cheap. <laughs> David, back to you. Well, yeah, just off that last thing you said, um, some of you know I've been. Uh, working up at Dave Brookover's place this summer. Uh, uh, and the amount of time he spends with the two labs that do his printing, getting things right, uh, is, is pretty incredible, but it shows in his work up there. And yeah, I know Barney was up the other day and we were looking at this metallic paper that Dave's fallen in love with. <laughs> and it, 
boy, in the right light, it produces spectacular results. So, uh, uh, but yeah, I, printing's like it's a whole nother world. There's as much to learn about that, I think, as there is about the whole getting the photograph. So, uh, guys, I yeah, want to think. And David, just oh, just, just as a, just as a, as one one quick add on. Uh, of course, we've got a club member here in CJ who who prints professionally. And, and I always encourage people um, uh, back, in, back in Chapel Hill and, and, uh, and the like that, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's critical to get to know your printer and, uh, and the printer to get, to get to know your style as well, because they, they can go ahead and tweak, their Im tweak the image to go ahead and, and give the result that, that you want. And um, uh, I've got, I've got a, a black and white print that, 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 that uh, CJ did uh, for me, and I got to tell you, it's just absolutely spectacular, and uh, um, and it's it's it it's it was it's so superior to what a professional lab did in in Raleigh. It was a uh, it was it was actually amazing. So, um, yeah, and it's 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 uh, it, it's we've got a we've got a great club member who knows an awful lot, a lot more about printing than I do, and uh, I, I think that. Uh, um, if I were out here uh, 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 even more, I'd, I'd be using her services. Yeah. I want to thank uh, Rachel and Barney for stepping up and being the experts. And uh, I know I had some great questions. I know a lot of them, some of them were very detailed, but some of them were also kind of broad in scope and I uh, hope this helped everyone. And like I said, we're recording this. I'll try to get this online as soon as possible, but it'll go to the website and, <laughs> and it'll take you to a YouTube channel that we have. So any other questions okay. before we go? And, yes, I just want to comment that as, as one of the complete non-experts, this was incredibly valuable. I want to say a special thank you. <clears throat> thank you to, to Rachel and David and, and, and Barney. I, not only that I appreciate all the answers to my own questions, but I learned a lot from listening to the answers to the other questions. Uh, it's just incredibly valuable. I, I don't know quite what motivates you guys to go ahead and spend a couple of hours answering questions like this, but I really appreciate it. Thank you. I agree with Sid. I think that uh, this is something we should do a couple, more than just once a year, a couple of times, maybe every quarter. Uh, get people involved with asking questions of things that really can help them out. I, I valued all, almost every single one of the questions that were here. And uh, I will say this, just looking at the questions we got, um, I don't know, we'll try to either do maybe a monthly or something on just Photoshop and Lightroom, but then also on printing. It, it seems to be the heart of almost, I mean, if you and look at all the questions, <laughs> uh, uh, probably three quarters of what we had on questions somehow revolved around those subjects. So, uh, and, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about it on the, the next meetings. So, uh, anything else? Thank you, David. Oh, Good job. Thank, yeah, thank you guys and thank thanks. Marty. And, thanks, and David. Rachel for stepping up and uh, uh, for a light note, yeah. Penny, my cat wants to say hi to your cat. Oh, you won't stop climbing on me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just thought I'd break it a little levity there. Cool. <laughs> That's great. Um, um, all Thank right. You. Well, I uh thanks everyone i know it's kind of run a little long but that that's good hopefully we got the information out and i know some of the people who asked questions weren't able to be on so we'll try to get this online pretty quickly so. thank you all right thank, thank you so much thank, thank you thank all you right. all right everybody bye. all right bye